All right, so today we're taking a deep dive into the world of Emily Dickinson. Um, you've provided us with her poems, letters, and biography snippets. And, well, our mission is, I guess, to uncover the woman behind the myth. Like, forget reclusive poet. We're searching for the real Emily. And I think what is so captivating about this particular deep dive is how we see these different pieces, like her personal relationships, her family dynamics, even, even the happenings of her time, all thread their way into her poetry in really fascinating ways. It's like she's leaving a trail of breadcrumbs, almost daring us to, to discover her true self. Mm -hmm. And speaking of trails, let's start with her family tree. It wasn't exactly uh, a haven of sunshine and rainbows, was it? Not quite a Norman Rockwell painting, no. You know. Her father, Edward Dickinson, was a, a prominent lawyer, very strict, even authoritarian, you mm. could say. And, well, we don't know a lot about her mother directly. But um, sources describe her as being perpetually shrouded in this melancholic presence, almost a ghost haunting the background. And then there's the grandfather, Samuel Fowler Dickinson. I mean, this is a man who went from being a community leader to financial ruin. I mean, yeah. that kind of fall from grace, it had to leave its mark on the entire family. Absolutely. You can practically trace those echoes of instability and estrangement in Emily's later poetry. The sense of being at a distance from the world, of observing rather than participating. It's a recurring motif, that's for sure. So how do we actually see these early influences play out in her work? I mean, it's one thing to say estrangement, but how does she actually put that feeling into words? Well, let's take a look at this excerpt from one of her poems. It would never be common more. I said, difference had begun. Many a bitterness had been suffering. But that old sort was done. And, and notice how she emphasizes this separation, this difference that sets her apart. It's almost prophetic, wouldn't you say? It's like she already senses she's on a different path, even at this early stage. And speaking of paths... Her relationship with religion is another fascinating piece of the puzzle. I mean, she was surrounded by devout family and friends, right? Yes, her, her upbringing was steeped in religion. She even attended Mount Holyoke, a very religiously strict school at the time. But um, instead of finding solace in the traditional structures of faith, Emily, she seemed to forge her own path. You know? It's almost ironic. Someone so deeply familiar with the Bible finding comfort in the natural world over, over organized religion. And that's where her genius lies, isn't it? She she deeply understood the structures of faith and belief, but chose to find her spiritual connection elsewhere. It, it speaks to an incredibly independent mind, don't you think? Absolutely. But before we get too serious here, let's talk about something a little lighter. I was struck by the playfulness in some of Emily's letters. There's There's a lightness there that challenges the typical image of the somber poet. You're absolutely right. She had a delightful sense of humor, a mischievous side that often gets overlooked. For example, she writes about outsmarting Jack Frost in her garden, picking her prettiest flowers before the frost could get to them. It's a small detail, but it speaks volumes, doesn't it? This wasn't a woman who simply shut herself away from the world. She she found joy in small triumphs, in outwitting nature, in, in playing with language itself. It's a side of her we don't often get to see. And it makes you wonder what other surprises are hidden within her work. It's like we're getting this this glimpse behind the curtain, you know, like into the moments that shaped her worldview. Mm -hmm. And well, speaking of shaping, let's talk about the impact of loss on Emily's life, on her work. Uh, the death of her close friend, Sophia Holland, at such a young age. I mean, that must have been incredibly difficult for her. It was a pivotal moment for Dickinson. Hmm. This This early experience with death seemed to to solidify her fascination with mortality, a theme that echoes throughout her poetry, really. It's more than just a passing interest, though, wouldn't you say? It's like she's almost dissecting death, exploring it from every angle. Precisely. She she doesn't shy away from the, the physicality of death at all. Take these lines, for instance. I heard a fly buzz when I died. The stillness round my form was like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm. She paints such a vivid picture of that, that liminal space between life and death. It's it's haunting, but also incredibly powerful. Yes. And it makes me wonder about her views on love. After all, death and love are often intertwined in art, right? Like two sides of the same coin. That's a keen observation. And speaking of love, we, we can't talk about Emily Dickinson without addressing her relationship with Susan Gilbert, her sister-in-law. Right, right. Their letters are are filled with such raw emotion, such such longing. It's definitely a relationship that continues to fascinate scholars even today. Oh, absolutely. The the depth of their bond is is undeniable. Listen to the way Emily describes their connection. 
I cannot believe, dear Susie, that I have stayed without you almost a whole day long. Sometimes the time seems short, and the thought of you is warm as if you had gone but yesterday. It's, it's intimate, deeply personal. The way she uses language to capture those feelings, it's remarkable. And it, it reminds me of another artist who grappled with, with intense emotions in his work, Franz Schubert. I know you wanted to explore this connection further. Yes, it, it might seem like an unusual pairing at first. Right. A, a 19th century American poet and an Austrian composer. But um, the parallels in their lives and in their work are, they're actually quite striking. Both struggled with controlling fathers, faced a lack of recognition during their lifetime, and um, and suffered from declining health. And their art reflects these struggles, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Both Dickinson and Schubert channeled their experiences into art that explores themes of isolation, longing, and, and finding solace and expression. So while their chosen mediums differed, they were united by these these shared human experiences. Exactly. And and both possessed this remarkable ability to to convey the complexities of human emotion with incredible depth and nuance. For example, um, listen to the way Schubert uses dissonance and resolution in his string quartet number 14, Death and the Maiden, mm -hmm. to mirror the emotional turmoil of confronting one's mortality. It's, it's a similar emotional landscape that Dickinson evokes in her poetry. It's fascinating to see how these universal themes transcend time, place, even even artistic mediums. But let's let's bring our focus back to Emily and her unique approach to language, especially when it comes to the natural world. It wasn't just about, you know, pretty flowers and sunsets for her, was it? Not at all. No. Nature was a, a source of deep inspiration for Dickinson, but it was also a lens through which she explored uh, larger philosophical and spiritual ideas. Yeah. Her poems aren't simply nature descriptions. They're they're filled with metaphors and double meanings. Precisely. Yeah. For for Dickinson, nature was a, a doorway to understanding larger truths about life, death, and the, the human condition. That makes me think of one of her most famous lines. Nature is what we know, yet have no art to say, so impotent our wisdom is, <laughs> her simplicity. She's, she seems to be acknowledging the limitations of human understanding when it comes to something as vast and complex as, as nature. It, it speaks to her humility, her, her willingness to acknowledge that there are, there are forces at play beyond our comprehension. And, and this is where we really begin to see how her unconventional spirituality intersects with her fascination with the, with the natural world. She found solace in the beauty and mystery of nature in a way that traditional religion may not have, may not have provided. You could say that nature became her church, a, a place of contemplation and connection with something, something larger than herself. It's another example of how Emily Dickinson defied expectations, forging her own path in both her life and her art. And, and speaking of forging a path, let's, let's talk about her artistic process itself. She, she didn't exactly seek fame and recognition, did she? No, in fact, she, she seemed to have a complicated relationship with, with the idea of an audience. From what I gathered, very few of her poems were published during her lifetime, and the ones that were published were often heavily edited to fit conventional standards. It's true. Dickinson primarily shared her work with a, a small circle of trusted friends and, and correspondents. One of his correspondents was Thomas Wentworth Higginson, a, a prominent literary critic of the time, and their letters offer this fascinating glimpse into her insecurities and, and aspirations as a writer. Yes. It's almost as if we get a, a front row seat to her internal struggle, you know, the, the desire for validation battling against the fear of exposure. She clearly respected Higginson's opinion, but was also wary of, of compromising her unique voice. It speaks to her integrity as an artist, really. She, she was unwilling to sacrifice her vision, even, even for the sake of recognition. It's a struggle many artists face, even today. But it makes me wonder, how did she, how does she cope with that tension? That's where her meticulous approach to language comes in. The, the act of writing itself became a form of control, a, mm. a way to order her thoughts and, and emotions. It's almost as if she found freedom within the constraints of language. Precisely. She, she used language as a tool, shaping and refining it to create a world entirely her own. And it's within those carefully crafted lines that we, that we find the true brilliance of Emily Dickinson. It's like she's giving us a masterclass in precision and intentionality, you know, with, with every word choice, every dash, it makes you appreciate the power of language in a whole new way. Absolutely. And, and it's through that meticulous craftsmanship that she manages to tackle these huge universal themes, right. love, death, faith, doubt, with, with such profound depth. 
And she does it all within the confines of her own world, a world she largely chose not to share publicly during her lifetime. It, it makes you wonder, what would Emily Dickinson, the poet who cherished solitude, make of our hyper-connected world today? Now, that's a fascinating question. Would she, would she embrace the digital age, sharing her thoughts on Twitter, her poems on Instagram? Or would she, would she double down on privacy, her words remaining her closely guarded treasures? It's almost impossible to imagine her navigating the world of online personas and, and viral sensations, isn't it? She was so deliberate, so thoughtful in her communication. It really challenges us to think about the trade-offs of our modern age, doesn't it? The, mm. the immediacy of connection versus the, the slow burn of contemplation, the, yeah. the allure of a broad audience versus the intimacy of a select few. It's a question without an easy answer. Which I guess seems fitting when when discussing Emily Dickinson. She defied easy categorization in life. And, and her work continues to challenge and provoke us, even now, well over a century later. And that's the mark of truly great art, isn't it? it? It sparks these conversations, these introspective journeys that extend far beyond the page. Or or in Dickinson's case, the, the carefully penned lines on, on scraps of paper. She might not have actively sought fame or, or recognition, but her words have certainly found their way into the hearts and minds of countless readers. And, and that brings us back to you, the listener. Why, why does Emily Dickinson still matter? Why should her life and work resonate with us today? It's more than just admiring her use of language or, or her unique perspective. It's about recognizing the, the universality of her themes. The anxieties, the desires, the fears she grapples with in her work, those are emotions and experiences that transcend time and place. She reminds us it's okay to, to sit with discomfort, to question, to explore the shadows alongside the light, that, that there's a strange and beautiful power in, in embracing our own contradictions. And that even in solitude, even in the quiet spaces of our own minds, we can find a profound connection, not just with ourselves, but with, with those who have walked a similar path who have wrestled with the same existential questions. So as we emerge from this deep dive into the world of Emily Dickinson, we, we leave you with this thought. How can her unflinching introspection inspire your own journey of self-discovery? What hidden depths within yourself might be revealed through a closer examination of the natural world, through the, the careful selection of your own words, through, through embracing your own unique voice? Those are questions only you can answer, of course, but but hopefully this exploration of Emily Dickinson's life and work has, has provided a few lanterns to, to light the way.